All right, so we're continuing with the panel. Had some really nice, uh, we had some really nice conversations over coffee, so I'm looking forward to continuing them over, um, over the next hour and a half or so. Um, so we're going to have, at the, at the end of, um, of, of this panel, we're going to have another discussion with everyone together. But um, first of all, here is the final presentation of the panel from Professor Nick Riggle of, of the University of San Diego. Um, Nick is an assistant professor of philosophy at the University of San Diego. He specializes in aesthetics, um, exploring both issues of how issues of moral psychology and aesthetics interact. I first met Nick, I guess, when we were both graduate students in New York a few years ago, and since then he has, you know, gone through the stratosphere of um, of philosophy. He's published in. Um, as you, if, you, if you look up his work in all of the you know, big name journals in philosophy, um, but he is also the author of um, a popular book called "On Being Awesome: A Unified Theory of How Not to Suck," published by Penguin, which I heartily recommend. It's one of uh, one of the readings, and we're going to take a slight departure from from the topic that me and Sarah covered, which was issues of ethics, moral conscience, propaganda to do with art to now talk about the, if you like, the bigger question of how do we live through these concepts in everyday life in relation to um, roles and rules in the ethics of style. So please join me in welcoming Nick. Thanks, Fid. Uh, and thanks for having me. It's a true, deep, profound pleasure to be here. I, uh, I went to bed last night like with a huge smile on my face. Um, and we like had the floater plane in, and we like got to explore the grounds, and like I live a pretty exciting life, and I, I had one of the more exciting days of my life <laughs> yesterday, <laughs> and I'm just so thrilled to be here. Um, so um, yeah, I want to take up some of these themes and talk a little bit about style and the expression of individuality in democratic life, um, in, in, um, in our public roles and in our personal lives. So um, do you all remember? President Barack Obama. Yeah. Remember that guy? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, what did he wear? Casual. Pretty casual, but when he was, you know, being president, he wore suits. What color? What what color were they? Yeah, typically navy blue. Every once in a while, you'd get a you'd get an exciting gray one. Right. So. This is a common look, yeah? Here he is on the left at the beginning of his presidency, or near the, near the beginning. There he is on the right, kind of near the end. Um, not much change, yeah? He's changed his hairstyle a little bit, um, or he's, a, he's accepted the graying. Um, yeah. So um, when Obama was asked why he does this, why does he just wear the, basically the same thing every day? He said this, you'll see. I wear only gray or blue suits. I'm trying to pare down decisions. I don't want to make decisions about what I'm eating or wearing because I have too many other decisions to make. I said this in 2014, right? Six years into wearing basically the same thing every day. Um, his comment here is actually, it echoes in content the comment from another style icon, a person we all deeply admire for style inspiration, Mark Zuckerberg, who in 2014 said this, I really want to clear my life so that I have to make as few decisions as possible about anything except how to best serve this community. I feel like I'm not doing my job if I spend any of my energy on things that are silly or frivolous about my life so that way I can dedicate all my energy towards just building the best products and services, he added. So um, there's something in the air about super powerful people and style at the time. They seem to suggest that style's too trivial or unimportant to be worth their time. This all changed in 2014, so it's striking that Obama said this in 2014. When Obama had a news conference and he wore this. <laughs> a tan suit, everyone. Look at that. And one with a quite long jacket, if you ask me, and rather baggy pants. Um, <laughs> this was meet, met with a, an uproar in the American media. And the headline that I liked the most that captured it was Gawker's headline. President Obama <laughs> shames America 
by wearing whack-ass tan suit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, in the spirit of our times, this was very divisive. <laughs> Some people said, wow, Obama, he really looks great. You know, let him wear whatever he wants, right? He's Barack Obama, he's the best. Other people were like, Greg Gawker, you know, fairly liberal media source, um, taking him to task for wearing a whack-ass tan suit. Um, so um, what I want to I start by just kind of questioning whether that's really a sincere answer that Obama gave, that he doesn't... He wants to wear the same thing every day, basically, because he's too busy. Right? He has other decisions to make. There's an air of disingenuousness, I think, there, um, in part just by comparing the awesome style that his wife has. Right? Michelle Obama was you know, one of the most stylish first ladies ever. And of course, there are pressure on women to, to dress up more and to, um, to make a public appearance in, in that way. But she's at least as busy as he is, and nonetheless found the time to make those decisions. And furthermore, Obama did decide to wear a whack-ass tan suit, right? He made that decision. That wasn't so hard. Why couldn't he do it more often? Um, so I don't think this is a sincere answer, and I want to kind of get behind uh, the philosophical details of, of what it would mean for a president um, to uh, express style uh, more individualistic style um, in the way that he did when he wore the tan suit. So I want to begin by asking maybe a classic philosophical question, a constitutive question. What is style? What is it? And furthermore, um, the question just motivated, how should people in power relate to it once we have some understanding of what it is? So that's what I'm going to do next is talk about style. So. The problem is, it turns out that on immediate philosophical reflection, style is profoundly confusing and it's super annoying. So if you're a philosopher, you start thinking about this and your head wants to explode. So I'm going to try to get your head to explode a little bit. So here's a little argument. We actually just saw this in the Sachs quote. Style is a way of doing things. Yeah? That's a pretty intuitive thought. If someone asks you, what's your style? It's just, it's just how I roll. That's my style. It's how I do things. Pretty, pretty common. Now, everyone has a way of doing things, right? I mean, if you're like in the world, you have a way of being in the world. Uh, and so everyone has style. There you go, everyone has style. On the other hand, we think, eh, but style's cultivated. Yeah. It's not easy to cultivate style. It's like an achievement if you've done it. And so not everyone has style. Like Mark Zuckerberg like doesn't have style. Right? And he's like, he's open about it. He's honest about it. The two claims in bold there should disturb you. I've given you two arguments. One, the conclusion is everyone has style. The second, the conclusion is not everyone has style. What do we call this in philosophy? A contradiction. A contradiction. <laughs> yeah. You should not accept both of those. So what should you accept? That's a question I pose to you. It turns out that things are even more complicated than this, unfortunately. Call this the descriptive contradiction about style. There's also an evaluative contradiction about style. So we hear uh, Obama and Zuckerberg basically voicing this thought. Style is superficial. Anything superficial doesn't really matter, right? It's kind of disposable. It doesn't really get to the heart of human life. So it's unimportant. It's something that you shouldn't emphasize. You should kind of dismiss it. On the other hand... Common thought. Style's inspiring and influential. There are like, there's an industry of style trying to get you to be inspired by it. Yeah? It's very problematic, but also in some ways very inspiring and can you know, help you find yourself. Um, if anyone watches um, the new Queer Eye, I think you'll notice how profound style can be for people, right? See these makeover shows where someone gets a new haircut and they turn around and look in the mirror and start crying. Because <laughs> it's such a tr uh, profound change to how they were thinking about themselves. So I think here's another argument. We can say style is inspiring and influential. Anything that's like that is important. And so style is important. So there you go. Now you have another contradiction to 
uh, wrap your head around. Style is unimportant, and style is important. So what I thought we could do at this juncture is uh, take a few minutes to chat together um, in, in, in little groups, maybe just with your partner, and think through these contradictions a little bit, um, and try to come to a conclusion. Which set of claims do you want to accept? You cannot accept that everyone has style and everyone does not have style. Your brain won't do it, even if in some sense you have a desire to do it. <laughs> your brain will stop you. Um, or style is unimportant versus style is important. Which one of those do you want to accept? You could, you could think, okay, everyone has style and it's important. Or style is unimportant and not, a, not everyone has it. Or you know, so people are wasting their time when they're doing it. Or, or whatever. There's, there's different combinations that you can come up with. But take a few minutes to, to think through this. Okay, let's, uh, let's reconvene briefly. I, I, uh, you know, I, I'd be impressed if you worked it all out. Um, but um, does it, maybe we can get a couple reports. What, did, what, did you, what conclusions did you come to? Yeah. Uh, first of all, I'm hoping to hear from the students on this one because this, I'm, I'm sure there's something to, to be said. But... Um, we, our little group, uh, had a wonderful uh, discussion about this. Um, but I wanted to just say that I think, f from my perspective, I think that there is something about style that has been quite deliberately, especially personal style, mm -hmm. and, and that is quite unique and creative if you, yeah. if you take it very seriously. And I have met a couple of stylists who per their personal style is quite dramatic and actually quite jarring and interesting um, so you know you could probably in a sense I might disagree with you you probably could agree with any of those statements and all of them um, but the, the question is in a specific situation where uh, there's someone's put a lot of deliberation into that statement that they're making um, it is important and it can be influential mm -hmm. and it's also really boring when people don't put a lot of you know thought into it and they're just sort of doing what they're doing and they're making a statement it's not a very interesting statement um, so I kind of disagree I think you probably could agree with all of those things in different situations mm. so style is ambiguous and it can mean different things in different contexts and so there's a sense Definitely. in which each one could be true depending in, on in how different contexts yeah. yeah so when we started the discussion first question we asked are we talking about the artist style or are we talking about our personal style mm -hmm. because this is a very wider term yeah so we wanted to narrow it down yeah. and uh, when we talk about the personal style i think it varies from time to time mm -hmm. so for example if uh, someone is working in a studio it won't just come to a conference in a studio dress They're, they will carry some kind of style according to the context in which Good. the artist in, yeah. is invited but if you're talking about the artist style and the work of style, so every, every artist has its own style, but mm -hmm. not every artist cultivate the style. Mm -hmm. If you cultivate the style, mm -hmm. it is important not only for you, but also for others because it's inspiring and it gives some meaning or you make some connections. Yeah. So everyone has style, but not everyone cultivates it. Uh -huh. But it is important. Uh -huh. In both cases, yeah. if you cultivate it, it is important for others and you as well, but if yeah. you don't cultivate it, it might be just important for you. Good. All right. That's great. Thanks so much. Um, okay, one, one more comment. Yeah. So, uh, first of all, I think it, uh, all of these terms can be true. It just depends on person and de uh, depends on situations. Mm -hmm. But it's not like it's uh, one of it's true, one of it's not, it false. And I, I'm all, I was also thinking like Denying a certain style and doing something different isn't it is a style. So, like, yeah. everyone has their own style. Mm -hmm. If it depends, you are thinking it as a style or not. But everyone has or yeah. think, think has its yeah. style. Good, good. Thank you. Yeah. When you started with uh, Obama, yeah. saying that he didn't want to make decisions yeah. about what he wore or ate mostly about what he wore. Um, <coughs> Chero and I were reminiscing about Jeff. And oh, good. <laughs> his style that became his black T-shirt, ah. khaki pants, and either a black leather jacket, which is the classic sort of sport coat type, or a brown one. 
That's what he wore. And it was a, uh, and suspenders. Oh, good. Okay. Yes, you nice. forgot those. And <clears throat> the, it truly was, he didn't want to have to think about clothes. Mm -hmm. That was, mm -hmm. you know, this is what I pack when I go somewhere, this is what I wear. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great, yeah. Although he <laughs> spent lots of time style. putting style in other things. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's wonderful. Yeah. Well, that's why I agree with the first statement because mm. even not even Jeff, for example, that still is a way of doing things. Mm -hmm. Even though it is a black T-shirt every day, that's a way of doing things. So everyone has a style. Yeah, yeah, good, nice, cool. I have a lot of sympathy for that claim. I'm, I'm, that's interesting. So um, I have sympathy for it too. It's a very natural thought. I wanted to motivate a couple further thoughts by way of. So even if you do think that everyone has style, um, there's still a question about what does it mean uh, to cultivate a style, and what is what is what are we doing when we're cultivating a style? Um, uh, just just saying that everyone has a style doesn't quite get give us a grip on that thought. What is it when style is an achievement? What what have you achieved? Um, well, you've achieved style, but like, what is that, right? So um, a first thought is that style is a form of self-expression. When you engage in style, when you cultivate your style, when you, when you express a style, what you're doing is you're expressing a self. But the term self, as we know in philosophy, is radically ambiguous and super vague, and so the first thing we want is a little further clarity on what it is, uh, what feature of the self is expressed in style. And a common answer to that question, what self, in the literature on art history and in the philosophical literature, is that it's personality. So what style is, is the expression of personality. And you see this thought um, in writing on artistic style. You see this thought in writing on personal style and fashion and so on. And so you might think, well, there, there's a cool thought. It's the expression of personality. If we, you know, you have a personality. You express it kind of in, in, what, you, in what you're wearing um, and how you talk and in your general demeanor and ways of life. However, um, I don't think that that thought is going to work because on the one hand, um, it, it makes sense of the first way of thinking that everyone has a style because everyone has a personality, right? It might not be a very interesting one, like we've been noting. Some people don't have very interesting style. But um, everyone has a personality. And furthermore, I submit to you, you don't try very hard to express it. Yeah? Sometimes it comes out despite yourself, uh, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, <laughs> yeah. So um, it's something that we easily express. It's not an achievement to express it. So although this thought is interesting, and it's, it makes sense of the thought that everyone has a style, and in a sense it's kind of unimportant in, in that sense that it's, it's easy to achieve. Um, it doesn't make sense of the, the, the right-hand side, the thought that, well, not everyone really has it. It's something that's cultivated, and um, it's something that can be really important. So what I want to suggest is that style is the expression of ideals. So not personality, but not who you are, but who you aspire to be. Yeah? So style is the expression of your ideal self, as it were. Um, what's nice about this is that it makes sense of artistic style, too. You can say that artistic style is the expression of the ideals that the artist has for her work. Um, what's nice about that is that it helps us understand cases where um, there's a radic radical departure um, in the artist between what they express in their works and who they are as a person. So philosophers like to call this the Anna Karenina objection to the personality theory of style. So um, in Anna Karenina, Tolstoy is this like, wonderfully compassionate and caring and attentive person, particularly attentive to the plight of women in contemporary Russian society. Um, Tolstoy himself, apparently, was very much not like that. <laughs> um, um, he was intolerant. He liked to quarrel. He was, he was petty and not very pleasant to be around. Um, so, so I hear. Um, and so what's going on there? Artistic style can't be the expression of Tolstoy's personality because he doesn't, his personality is very different. Um, what, what I want to say is that it's the expression of the ideals that Tolstoy has for his art. He wants to be a compassionate writer, even if in his own life as a person he has 
struggles with um, being compassionate or maybe doesn't even care about, about it. Um, and so I think this helps with the idea that style is cultivated. How is it cultivated? Well, we cultivate style in part by cultivating an ideal self. We can draw inspiration from lots of different sources, think about um, who we want to be, who we aspire to be, and express that in our decisions. And this is also helping us explain how uh, the importance of style can be exploited by commercial culture, because it can feed you ideals that you shouldn't have, or feed you ideals that um, will direct your life in ways that benefit commercial culture or um, other forms of um, power. So um, anyway, I offer that to you as, as a theory of style, um, something, to, something to chew on. Um, uh, Notice that if we think about style that way, as, as the cultivation and expression of ideals, there's something super odd about really powerful people in democratic societies saying that it's not important, right? So whatever else it is, style is the expression of your individuality. The ideal theory of style makes sense of that. Um, you cultivate your individuality by cultivating your values, i.e. the ideal self that you want to embody. And so um, if we didn't do this, if we didn't value style, then we would not be visible to one another as individuals. We would all just be sort of masked behind the various social, practical roles and norms that we have to uh, live by in order to live in a peacefully efficient society. So to, to, to emphasize this point, the importance of style, I want to talk a little bit about the pervasiveness of social and practical norms in our lives. There are so many of these practical roles, and we embody them like most of the day, right? You're all doing it right now. You're embodying the role of audience member at an academic talk. You're doing really good, by the way. Like, perfect job. Um, <laughs> But you all know how to do it, right? You're sitting there very politely. No one's you know, trying to crack jokes, um, except for me and failing. But um, uh, I mean, you see my little sheep, right? <laughs> uh, so, um, but we do this all the time. When we walk down the street, when we order coffee, when we go to the bar, when we um, you know, rent a hotel room or whatever, fly on a plane, we, all, we typically embody these social and practical roles the scripts for which we've just internalized somehow. We all know how to do it, and we do it really well, and we all do it the same, basically. So to illustrate this, just think of an um, example I have in my book, but I'll do it here again. Um, when you order coffee, there's a very basic script that plays out, and we all do it basically in the same way. So someone greets you, hi, what can I get for you today? And you respond, I'd like a large coffee. The person says, that'll be $2. Um, or if you're in San Diego, like six. Um, <laughs> um, the employee says, here you go. Um, here you go, have a nice day. Uh, and, and so on. You know, polite exchange, efficient, boom, awesome. We need these, right? We need these roles. If we didn't have these scripts memorized, like you would all be, I don't know what you'd be doing right now, right? You'd be running around like crazy. Couldn't, I couldn't communicate to you clearly. Uh, we couldn't order coffees. We couldn't fly on airplanes. Like a good, peaceful, egalitarian society like needs these scripts, needs these roles. We need to internalize them. And they, of course, need to be respect respectful. Um, they need to be egalitarian. They need to be moral. Um, so just to summarize, that exchange follows these common norms and roles that are essential to a, a peaceful, egalitarian, democratic society. But I think as a result, uh, who we are as individuals is a bit obscured. So maybe some, something comes out in a, a little bit, but typically when we're um, playing out these scripts, we're just kind of uh, being, uh, you know, das man or whatever. We're just being a normal human being uh, enacting whatever script or role we think we should enact in that, in that moment. And as a result, our individualities are not expressed. But we can play with these roles and riff on them or change them or break out of them in a way that does express our individualities. So um, suppose that instead of, um, after hearing, that'll be $2, please, um, I say, here you go. Instead of saying that, I crack a joke, right? 
this is a brilliant joke, you should all be laughing at it. Uh, <laughs> no, it's a very stupid proto like dad, dad joke, but here we go. So, um, Hi, what can I get for you today? I'd like a large coffee, please. That'll be $2, please. And you say, small price to become human again. Well, boom, you, you've no, you're no longer in the script here. You've just broken out. And what have you done? You've expressed your sense of humor, right? You've just expressed your individuality. You've got a dad sense of humor, or like a proto war. Maybe it's a little better than dad joke. Okay, it's a little bit. Ish, yeah. <laughs> um, so you've just broken out of your role in a way that allows the employee to make a decision, right? He can take up the joke and express some individual response in response, or continue to play the role of employee. Yeah? So um, the employee might say something um, kind of blunt, right? Welcome back. <laughs> um, they might say, it's not a price I'm willing to pay. Um, <laughs> uh, or they might say something like, um, here's your coffee. Uh, <laughs> um, so uh, when, the, when the employee takes up your joke in response to your sense of humor, the employee in turn expresses their individuality by expressing their sense of humor or their sense of whatever, witty banter or whatever, or whatever it is. And as a result of you breaking out of your role, you've given the employee an opportunity to break out of theirs. And when it goes well, there's a little community of individuals, right? You've broken out of these roles in a nice way, and you've seen each other for the individual each other is, not just, you know, I'm a customer, you're an employee. Um, so as much as we need those customer-employee roles, style is super important. I, th I think of this as a little instance of style. I'm expressing my sense of humor, my sensibility. Um, in a kind of democratic, individualistic, and pluralistic society, it plays a super important role in creating these moments of community and connection among individuals when a lot of society has to be run according to these roles that we uh, all have internalized and typically embody in our social interactions and daily lives. So um, as an example of how a leader can riff on certain norms by way of creating these connections in a democratic, uh, well, in an aspirationally democratic global order, um, uh, consider how Trudeau uses socks. So um, typical politician does not wear Chewbacca socks. Um, and a typical politician does if they're, uh, typically if they're um, male identifying person, wear a kind of, you know, bland suit like this. And here's Trudeau, you know, donning the, the normal stuff. Except it didn't take long for people to realize that he had a little secret <laughs> under his shoe, um, which were these playful socks that he wore. Uh, and he would choose them really, uh, he chooses them very carefully to, um, to speak to a moment or to express something about what he's up to. So um, uh, an Irish politician um, who's really into Star Wars was visiting Canada, and so Trudeau wore Star Wars socks, and the politician, uh, I forget his name, um, yeah, uh, uh, responded in kind, wearing his own playful socks. And there you have another instance of these, the slight breaking of norms by way of um, expressing individuality in a way that creates a connection, right? This is, you know, they call it sock diplomacy, right? Um, I would call it awesome politics through socks. Um, but it's not dissimilar to this kind of interaction, right? It's a little riff. Um, and of course, the riffs can be much bigger than that. Um, but uh, there, there you have, I think, a politician in a, in a position of extreme power um, noting that something about the importance of the role requiring a fairly bland way of dressing uh, or style, but nonetheless being able to modify it slightly stylistically f to good effect, to good political effect. Now, that's very different from uh, Obama's gray suit, right? That wasn't like a playful Chewbacca sock. That was a whole suit. Um, 
And so uh, I think Obama has a much better answer uh, on reflection than the one he gave us. Why does he wear the same suit every day? Well, he's the leader of a representative democracy. What is a representative democracy? Can someone tell me? We don't know anymore. Well, <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> yeah, in principle. <laughs> yeah. The voice of the people is represented through an individual that speaks on their behalf. Exactly. Or, or bullshit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. Or, yeah, I like the disjunction. Let's go with that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but no, so ideally, right, the, the, the leader of a representative democracy uh, symbolizes the people. And so it's out of place for someone in that role to, through their demeanor, their style, express their individuality. They should be expressing, in some sense, the people, right? Um, and so I think for that reason, it makes sense for a politician to... Typically, I think there are exceptions, but um, it makes sense for a politician to abide by a kind of norm or, or ethics of style that is consonant with their role as the leader of a representative democracy. So the president's style should reflect the fact that they re represent a people and not a self. And the should here, I think, is a matter of ethics and aesthetics. It's something that um, should, govern, um, should govern us uh, when we're, when, we, when we're in certain roles. But how, sh how far should that should extend to other people in public roles? Does it extend to Congress people? Does it extend to judges, police officers, public teachers, and so on? And that's a difficult question. And furthermore, the should here so far is a matter of ethics and aesthetics. Uh, to what extent should it extend to law? Should there be laws about how we can dress in public roles. Um, if so, I might suggest a few for President Trump. Anyway, um, so uh, let's dwell on these questions briefly. Um, so uh, you might be aware of Bill 21. I thought I'd talk a little bit about it in this context. Um, so Quebec recently passed a bill that bans public employees from wearing religious symbols at work. So uh, teachers, judges, police officers, um, and other civil servants can no longer wear Muslim headscarves, Jewish skull caps, Sikh turbans, and other symbols of their faith in the, work in the workplace if they're a public servant. Now here we have several different public roles, um, and I think it's, it's really easy to make sweeping conclusions about these different roles and say one thing or the other, you know, whoever you agree with. Um, but I think we need to be kind of art critics about, about these roles and think about them individually and what's appropriate to each one. So we might think that, okay, morally speaking and aesthetically speaking, given the president's role, they should probably uh, tone down the style and, and, or cultivate a style that represents or is consonant with their role. But what about a judge or what about a, office, a police officer or a teacher? So I think it's absolutely essential to separate the moral questions from the political ones. So it might be, on the one hand, you might think that um, it's morally and aesthetically inappropriate for a judge to wear religious garb. And why might you think that? I don't know. Um, you know, turns out there's a history of conflict between Muslims and Christians. So if a blatantly Christian judge is presiding over a case that involves a Muslim defendant. At the very least, symbolically, that's a bit tough, um, especially in a you know aspirationally, you know um, sectarian kind of um, sec sorry secular um, uh, uh, justice system. It's one thing to think that there's a moral question that has a clear answer, which is something like maybe judges shouldn't um, or should. But it's a totally different question whether that should be legislated, whether there should be a law about this. Well, I think, you know, morally speaking, um, I, I thought of moral conscience when I was um, thinking about Jeff's thinking. And um, I, was, I was thinking, what does moral conscience require of us um, in, in these roles? So I thought of, you know, imagine 
imagine a religious teacher who teaches seventh grade, and uh, or maybe seventh, eighth grade. I don't know. When do we start like realizing that we're sexual beings? Uh, maybe, uh, yeah, around around that. Uh, <laughs> vid. My goodness. <laughs> um, so, um, whatever, say, say, say seventh grade. Um, uh, maybe that's too early. I don't know. Um, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm just thinking about my own life. <laughs> um, but consider, suppose there's a, relig- a religious teacher and you're questioning your sexuality at a, at, a, at a young age. And your teacher comes to class every day wearing this religious garb. It's very prominent. And in some ways, you might think it's beautiful, it's, it's, it's unique, it's an uh, impressive statement of, of that person's identity. But um, you go and look at the religious texts that are telling this person to wear those things, and you find in that religious text that it's deeply homophobic. Most of them are, unfortunately. And you're a seventh grader trying to figure out your sexuality. And the people who are, you admire seem to be adhering to a text that is deeply homophobic. I think if you are a public, in, a, in that public role, if you are that teacher, and you have not reflected on that, I think that's a failing of your moral conscience. I think you absolutely ought to have those kinds of reflections. What you should do, I think, is a very difficult question that's going to depend on the context, and you're going to have to weigh a lot of different things against one another. The importance of your role as a mentor to students, uh, the importance of your identity as a religious person, maybe intersectionally stuff about um, power dynamics in your marriage, maybe people telling you to wear certain things and the weight that that's going to have. So um, I think it's going to be important to uh, take each case individually. And then there's another question that we can talk about, um, about whether wearing religious garb is indeed stylistic. I think it is increasingly so, meaning whether it is indeed an expression of individuality rather than an expression of conformity to, uh, to a system. Um, I think it would be a failing not to reflect on how style might affect those over whom one presides. And just to wrap up, um, I wanted to note that the law that just passed is much stronger than this, and um, I, think it's, I think it's motivated in very bad ways by ill-meaning politicians, but this part of the law is clearly immoral and bad. Um, it says that anyone wearing face coverings are prohibited from receiving government services that include health care and using public transit. So um, if you are a Muslim woman who thinks it's important to wear a face veil, you cannot use public transit and you cannot access public health care. The law, the law says that. Um, and I think in a democratic society, we have to balance the importance of individual expression with the importance of our social norms and public roles. So this is one of the things that I think is really challenging as citizens of a, of a democracy. It's utterly important that we cultivate our individuality, that we express it in public, that we confront others with, with our values, basically. But we have to balance that between the good of certain institutions and roles that have to function in a certain way um, efficiently, respectfully, and so on, um, to help society chug along. And we can dramatically fail to balance this. So I think President Trump is currently failing when he's going golfing every weekend um, down in his resort in Florida. I think that's a, um, a, a failing of, the, of, of style in a, in a public role. But again, this balance requires careful, I call it aesthetico-ethical insight, and has to be achieved in a case-by-case uh, basis. And my, my view is that the law should absolutely stay out of it, that we should let people make these decisions, uh, help them understand the, the weight of the decisions that, that they're making, and that they're just, we should let the law stay out of it. Um, but that's something we can talk about further in the Q&A. So thank you. All right, so, um, so we've got about 10, 12 minutes for questions. So, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll start with the uh, students, and let's start with David. Okay. I'll, I'll start really easy, Nick, and give some of my colleagues an opportunity maybe to formulate more sophisticated questions. But um, to be honest, I'm not quite sure how to take 
some of this. And so to apply your own, uh, some of your own assertions uh, before I uh, render any judgment, can we see what kind of socks you're wearing? <laughs> no, I mean that. <laughs> okay, so, so, so that, that turned out to be actually way more information than I needed, but... <laughs> I, I do have socks on, but they're um, they're like those little ones, you know. Oh, okay. Yeah. They're not nude socks. That... They fit me. They're not that. They're not like they're not like ones I just found that are too small. They're oh, like, okay. Like, okay. Good. Yeah. Thank. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. They're nude. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, do I have a? <laughs> uh, yeah, that was a great rebuttal of the question. Um, do I have another question from the students, perhaps first? Yes. So you just ended by saying you think the law should stay out of it. And what would you say about like laws around nudity? No laws on nudity. There you go. <laughs> That's what I would say. But again, I think people should be good at judging when they should walk around naked, right? I mean, um, of course, there may be certain laws prohibiting nudity in certain places, like maybe the courtroom is not the best place to be nude. Um, but um, but in the public sphere, I, I personally, I, I don't, yeah, I don't think there should be laws against it. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes, I'm bringing. Little point to me. It's as you are talking about moral conscience. It, it's not only personal; it is personal, individual. But as we are in roles, public roles, and I get the point that we we should have ability to express our individuality even in the public norm or rules, whatever we have. But I'm just wondering how to balance both of these. And you, mm-hmm. it, towards the end, you ask that question that the balance is necessary. Yeah. Uh, yes, and I agree that yeah. law might not be able to bring that balance because law imposes things on people. Yeah. So, and balance is different for each individual. So yeah. law might not be the answer. But then I'm wondering, what is the answer and how to go and how to dig that answer? Because the example of a teacher for, uh, that you discussed, mm-hmm. if teacher is wearing something which is very personal to her faith yeah. or her individuality and her identity, it is a significant portion of her life. Mm-hmm. The teacher would not want to just leave behind her individuality mm-hmm. because of the students. And if she does that, she's not true to herself. So she won't be able to make any impact on the students if she's not true to herself. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. in that context, and students are important as well, so how to create that balance in a practical way that we go and that we just reach to win-win situation? Yeah. I mean, you're asking like the difficult question, right? Well, how do you buy? But I think, I think the answer is, is, is one of these kind of annoying answers, which is that, you know, it just depends. <laughs> it, it takes... I think it takes judgment in the moment, you know, this kind of um, Aristotelian ability to, to see what the right thing to do is in the situation. I mean, what, why did, I don't know, why did the person in the coffee shop just like spontaneously crack that joke? You know, what was it about the context that, um, that, that made that seem right or something like, like the right thing to do? Um, I think it can be really difficult to, to strike the balance. Um, about the public role, you know, and the teacher, I, just briefly, um, you know, I think, you know, there's a lot of roles that, that are professional roles that require a kind of uniform or that require a kind of, you know, like a doctor, or like a physician, um, or someone working in, in, in a retail context or something where, you know, we, we think it's fine to kind of not express yourself so as to embody this role um, by wearing, say, a uniform or acting in a certain way. Um, and and so uh, so I don't I don't think it's out of the question that a teacher would would think that way that okay in this role I think it's appropriate to to have a kind of uniform or something maybe a personal one that I make up or um, I'm not saying that's the right thing to do in 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 any case really but I just it is something to consider that that um, professional roles and uniforms are kind of a, you know a, a possibility. Um, Mark, you had a question. Excellent statement and the dialogue we're having. And it relates to the whole notion of, you know, how prohibitions on style, you know, such as we were talking about in Quebec, it's more than style, religious, you know, symbols and things related to one's identity. 
Um, in that case, it's about imposing another identity, namely Quebec as a culture that is francophone, mm -hmm. that relates to laws in France. You know, there's a very overt, I think, attempt to signify that French identity embedded in that prohibition. I think you're so, exactly right about that. Like, you know, then, yeah. then one has, has the whole situation of how you're being identified as inside or outside of a culture. And I think that's a real problem. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I think you're right about the law being motivated in those ways in, in that particular case. Yeah, and that's very, uh, to me, deeply objectionable. Uh, Zach, you had a question? So I wanted to ask about... Um, <laughs> In the dilemma at the beginning, you talked about the superficiality of style on the one hand, and I wanted to to see if the um, analysis of style gave you tools to explain that. Um, so, you know, you could think prima facie on the analysis that why style is thought to sometimes be superficiality is or to be superficial is that you fail to properly express your ideal, um, or that you. Um, favor individuality for individuality's sake rather than that ideal. Um, but I just wondered, yeah, what um, resources this analysis had to explain this, I think, genuine feeling of superficiality and so Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I don't know if I'm on the hook for explaining the, um, explaining away that intuition with the theory so much as just explaining it as kind of confused by itself, so so I'm tempted to say, oh, here people are confusing style with fashion, and I think fashion's a bit superficial because I, I don't want to diss fashion. I, I love fashion, um, like like as an art, um, but there's a kind of fashion industry um, where it is a little superficial, where um, you know one just wears whatever the you know the fashion, uh, the people in fashion power say is the thing, right? It's mustard this fall, so like. Get ready for the mustard sweaters, right? Here they come. Um, and that, that's kind of a superficial thing, and you might think, you might conflate that with style, um, where style is actually expressive of something. Uh, and so that, I'm more tempted to explain it that way, but I like, the, I like that. Maybe there's, maybe there's a way of using the theory to explain it, too. Um, maybe something like, uh, you know, it's the unreflective adoption of certain ideals. Um, that, is, that is a superficial, it's a thoughtless adoption of ideals that expressed through. Yeah, I think I'm sympathetic to that. Yeah, thanks. Um, Maria? Yeah. yeah. And then I'll go to John. Um, just to step back to what Ambreen was saying, um, and you have, everyone has kind of touched on this uh, to a certain extent since then, but, um, and more, this is more of a comment, I suppose, but in terms of wearing particular things, say a school teacher, um, I, I believe that it's more the role or the, the role that you bring to the uh, particular style that you are portraying, um, that is where the morality comes into it, I suppose, where what you want to express yourself, but also understand and realize that you cannot be imposing those particular ideas on your students or whomever you're inter interacting with. Um, and this just popped into my mind because it was relevant when I was growing up, but um, what your... Uh, your ideas would be on or how you feel about um, dress codes specifically um, imposed only on young young women and young girls in schools in terms of like their skirt having to be a certain length or like their straps of their of their tank top having to be like four widths I don't know that's something that I had to deal with as a student so um, <laughs> when I was 13 and having male teachers tell me to like put a coat on or something but um <laughs> <laughs> when I was honestly just wearing something like this. But anyways, just, yeah, what, what would your ideas be on, on that? Yeah, yeah so for, first of all, I'm sorry you had to experience it. That sounds terrible. Um, <laughs> but, um, yeah, I guess if you're 13, what, you're in eighth grade or something? Um, I, you know, I, I started thinking about this uh, recently because I'm working on this talk, but, um, you know, there, there are similar bands on... Um, what children can wear, I think, in France, uh, maybe in Belgium too, um, in schools, in public schools, um, and I'm sure the Quebecois government is is hoping to do something similar. I know they're looking at um, similar bans on religious items in daycare systems, um, but 
I don't know. I don't know what to think about it yet. I mean, yeah. So I, I have a. I'm sorry. I don't have a more uh, thoughtful answer. I mean, we want rules. Yeah. I mean, so so so. On the one hand, it seems like you know. In, I went to public schools my whole life, um, and we could wear basically whatever we want. I don't remember there being any kind of. Uh, limits to what we could wear as long as it was like clothing um, and uh, but but then I know that like a lot of people who pay for like a Catholic school or something have very strict dress codes um, and uh, I, I just I, I'm afraid but let's talk about it more because I, I want to hear more about uh, it yeah I've got a question from John and then we're going to move on to the next bit of the panel um, my question is uh, just to expand that what she said um do you think style changes with age? Because you didn't really talk about age much. Um, you know, and does, as you grow older, does your style change? Um, does, does, now how does it evolve? Does it, do you conform to it or do you rebel against it? And then how does that, in a larger social context, play how style evolves? Yeah, I love that. I love that question. Um, as a aging person. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, 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 so my theory of style is that it's the expression of, of, of ideals, and, and I think as we, as we age, our ideals change, um, and, and they should, I think. Um, but part of this depends on how you think about what, what it is to have a personal ideal. And I have a particular way of thinking about that, and which is very much in line with Sarah's comments on um, openness in uh, democratic citizenship. So the thought being that like part of part of what it is to be like a good democratic citizen is to kind of be open to like new value and new, new ways of life and not necessarily to adopt them as your own but just to kind of be attentive to that and appreciative of that when you, when you see it. And I think that when we're, when we're like that, I think we have this openness. Um, our style can change even more because, because we get influenced in, in ways that we might not have predicted or expected or might not have been in, in, consonant with the ideals that we that we had before we encountered you know some new way of life or some new 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 style um, and so um, yeah i think I think it changes a lot I think it should change a lot I think it's it's a it's a good feature of style that it that it's dynamic and, and open yeah all right so we're going to now move to a broader discussion but first let us thank Nick for uh, an inspiring talk.